Let's go over the three question warm up for Farm Basics 3. First question A patient cannot adduct her left eye on lateral gaze, but convergence is normal. So, what structure is damaged? Well, this is describing internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So, this would be the medial longitudinal fasciculus that's damaged. Specifically, it's the left MLF in this case. Next, mother brings in her two year old child who has had multiple viral and fungal infections and is found to be hypocalcemic. Which of the three types of germ cells, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm, gives rise to the missing structure in this child? So this is one of those multi-step questions. First, you have to recognize this patient has DeGeorge syndrome. Then the next step is to know that DeGeorge syndrome is caused by failure of the third and fourth branchial pouches to develop. Remember, that means no thymus and no parathyroids. And then finally, you have to remember that the branchial pouches are derived from endoderm. So the answer here is endoderm. And the last question, describe the sensory innervation of the tongue. So the anterior two-thirds of the tongue are innervated by the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7, and then the third division of the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve 5. And the facial nerve is going to sense taste, and then the rest of the sensation is sensed by the trigeminal nerve. And then the posterior third of the tongue is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve 9, and also the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. Cranial nerve 10 basically supplies the most posterior portion of the tongue. All right, let's get started with the lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to another Step 1 video. Today we're talking about sympathetic activation. Now, if you think this subject is about improving your ability to project sympathy and kindness into an uncaring world, then you're out of luck. We will not be petting baby kittens, nor will there be any group hugs. The only hugs we'll likely see is you clutching your chest due to the severe tachycardia from a sudden increase in beta-1 activity caused by the sudden norepinephrine release due to the panic attack that you should be having right now because you don't know the material. And if you didn't follow that bit of physiology, then you might want to go to your safe place right now and begin the relaxation breathing. Ah, I'm just kidding. Look, it's pretty kitty. All right. So this lecture is going to cover sympathetic activation. In previous lectures, we've covered parasympathetic activation and inhibition. So now we're going to cover the other side of the autonomic nervous system. Now recall, when we spoke about the parasympathetic nervous system, we had a very long preganglionic neuron that ended at the ganglion, and that was very close to the effector organ. Acetylcholine would stimulate the nicotinic receptor at the ganglion, and then again, acetylcholine would stimulate the muscarinic receptor on the effector organ. Well, this changes considerably in the sympathetic nervous system. The preganglionic neuron is very, very short, and the ganglion is near the spinal cord, not close to the effector organ like we saw in the parasympathetic nervous system. The postganglionic fibers are very, very long, and then they branch multiple times, thereby innervating more than one organ system. Again, the sympathetic nervous system uses acetylcholine to stimulate the nicotinic receptor on the ganglion. But then it uses norepinephrine to stimulate adrenergic receptors on the effector organs. So why is this important? Well, where there can be a lot of tight one neuron to one organ control in the parasympathetic nervous system, and again, that's due to those really long preganglionic fibers going all the way to the effector organs, you actually don't have that kind of control in the sympathetic nervous system. All those postganglionic fibers are branching all over the place. Therefore, when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, you tend to uh, stimulate a whole lot of stuff. All right, so we need to talk about adrenergic receptors. This is the, the main part of this lecture that you really need to know. And there's really just four that you need to know really, really well. Alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. So when alpha-1 receptors are stimulated, this results in vascular smooth muscle contraction. And this leads to increased peripheral resistance, increased blood pressure, madriasis, and increased bladder sphincter muscle contraction. Now what about alpha-2 receptors? These are a bit different. Uh, you only find alpha-2 receptors on maybe a, a few certain uh, effector organs like the beta cells of the pancreas and then on very certain smooth muscle cells. The most important location of the alpha-2 receptor is on the presynaptic nerve itself. And when stimulated, the alpha-2 receptor acts in, uh, to inhibit actual more norepinephrine release. So let's go through this example. You have a sympathetic nerve fiber and it's been stimulated to release norepinephrine. Some of that norepinephrine is going to circle back on itself and bind to the alpha-2 receptors on that same neuron. And that's going to cause inhibition of further norepinephrine release. So this is a negative feedback mechanism. Also because they're also present on the pancreas, they can inhibit insulin release as well. What about beta-1 receptors? Well, beta-1 receptors, when stimulated, will cause tachycardia. You're going to see increased lipolysis. You're going to see increased myocar uh, myocardial contractility and increased release of renin. 
Now, as you can tell here, there are a lot of beta-1 receptors on the heart. And then what about beta-2? Beta-2 receptors will cause uh, some vasodilation, which will lead to a slightly decreased peripheral resistance. You're going to see bronchodilation, that's a big one to remember, increased lipolysis, increased insulin res uh, release, and decreased uterine tone. You also generally see an increase in heart rate, but this is not because of direct stimulation of the heart, like we see with our beta-1 receptors. Here, the heart rate is increasing because of a compensatory response due to a drop in blood pressure from that vasodilation. Now, adrenergically, innervated organs tend to have a predominance of one type of receptor. For example, tissues such as uh, the vasculature to, uh, to skeletal muscle have both alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors, but maybe the beta-2 predominate. And then, as we said before, the heart contains a lot of beta-1 receptors, and then you might think of maybe the, uh, the lungs having a lot of beta-2 receptors. So depending on which uh, organ, you'll see those type of receptors, and that's how you see our effect. Okay, so let's pound this into your brain one more time. You have to have this done, or nothing else in this lecture is going to stick. So let's go to some Lewis notes. All right, welcome to another Lewis Notes, guys. We're doing another matching game. We're looking at our adrenergic receptors. We're going to combine uh, our uh, results here when we're stimulating these receptors. What are you going to get? So the first one we have here is heart rate, and we're increasing our heart rate, remember, with our beta-1. It's always uh, going to be beta-1 because those are really on the heart. Next, we have decreasing uterine tone. Sometimes people forget this one, but this is actually going over here with beta-2. Uh, next, we have increasing blood pressure. Um, I'm putting this over here with alpha-1. It would probably also be with beta-1 as well, but alpha-1, you think of that peripheral resistance going up. Inhibiting norepinephrine. Remember, this is very unique to alpha-2. That's actually how it's going to work to decrease blood pressure to some extent. Increasing heart contractility. So what's on the heart? Remember, on our heart is our beta-1s primarily. Madriasis. This is another one that's a little bit trickier to remember, but remember, madriasis is going to go with our alpha-1. Increased bladder sphincter tone, again, alpha-1. Remember, our alpha blockers are going to be going after those. Vasodilation. So vasodilation, it's not dramatic, but you are going to get a little vasodilation with beta-2. Increasing renin, that's going to go with beta-1. Bronchodilation, very important one, probably the most important one to remember is going to be with beta-2 again. And then increasing peripheral resistance, uh, that's going to go along with our alpha-1 over here, and that's why you're going to increase the blood pressure uh, with that. All right, guys, so that's going to be it for our Lewis Notes. So next, we're going to cover the sympathomimetics. So a sympathomimetic is a drug that stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. However, the effect that each drug exerts will depend on the receptor it actually stimulates. And since we just learned our receptors, we should actually be in pretty good shape here concerning these drugs. Now, first, we're going to cover the direct sympathomimetics. So the direct uh, agonists are going to bind to those adrenergic receptors themselves without interacting with the presynaptic neuron. So the first one here is epinephrine, and epinephrine stimulates basically all of the major adrenergic receptors that we just mentioned. So it's going to stimulate alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. So when do we use it? Well, you're going to use epinephrine for anaphylaxis. So if a patient is severely allergic to something like peanuts, he or she may carry around an EpiPen, which is just a syringe that patients can carry around, and they can actually self-administer that epinephrine if they start to have a major reaction. Now, it can also be inhaled in certain situations. So if patients have a respiratory problem like severe croup, uh, you can inhale epinephrine and actually get that beta-2 action going. Epi can also be used in hypotension, and that makes sense because the alpha-1 will vasoconstrict and the beta-1 will increase the heart rate. Next one we have is norepinephrine. So here we see a lot of strong alpha-1, a lot of strong alpha-2 stimulation, maybe a little bit of beta-1, uh, but not a whole lot of beta-2 here. Now, norepinephrine can also be used for hypotension because it has such strong alpha-1 stimulation, it's going to uh, potentially uh, decrease renal perfusion uh, due to that vasoconstriction. But norepinephrine is usually first line for something like septic shock because in septic shock, you have a lot of significant vasodilation in blood vessels throughout the body and you want to correct that. But also realize that you can use it for cardiogenic shock as well. Next, we have isoproteranol. Well, isoproteranol really is only going to work on beta-1 and beta-2, and it's really not used clinically very much anymore. Next, we have dopamine, which is a little bit of a different one, a little bit more complicated. At low doses, dopamine will stimulate dopamine receptors. Now, we haven't talked about dopamine receptors much in this lecture. Most of the time, we think of dopamine receptors as being in the central nervous system, being associated with things like schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease when you have problems. But we also have dopamine receptors in blood vessels and in the kidney as well. Now, at medium doses, we see stimulation of beta-1 and beta-2, and then at high doses, we stimulate alpha-1 and alpha-2. So when are we going to use this drug? Well, dopamine can be used in shock. Uh, it was thought that the stimulation of those dopamine receptors that we talked about in the kidney might actually help with renal perfusion. But studies now have shown that dopamine, uh, when used in shock, actually doesn't improve renal function much at all. 
Next, we have dobutamine. Uh, so this works primarily at the beta-1 receptor. So where do we see our beta-1 receptors? Remember, that was in the heart. So dobutamine increases the heart rate in contractility. Now, you may see in some places that it won't increase heart rate, but actually dobutamine really will. Now, we use this a lot in stress tests. So some patients maybe can't walk on a treadmill to get their heart rate up, so we give them things like dobutamine to stress out their heart. Uh, and then also, you can use this clinically in patients with heart failure. Next, we have phenylephrine. So phenylephrine causes strong alpha-1 stimulation. So this is used for things like pupillary dilation. It's also very commonly used as a nasal decongestant. Next, we have albuterol, levalbuterol, and salmeterol. Uh, these have strong beta-2 stimulation, maybe a little bit of beta-1 as well. And these are used mostly as inhaled drugs, and we use this for things like asthma. Because of their beta-2 stimulation, they're going to cause a lot of bronchodilation, so people can breathe. Now, because of that beta-1 activity, patients will often get tachycardia when they're taking inhalers, but this is less pronounced in uh, medicines like levalbuterol. Next, we have terbutaline. So this has a strong beta-2 and some beta-1, kind of like our previous drugs. It can be used for bronchospasm, uh, but you also see this being used for uh, tocolysis. So this is to inhibit uterine contractions in someone who's having premature labor. Now, terbutaline can also be used uh, sub-Q, uh, which is great for immediate action. If you have to get someone to stop laboring, you want to give them that sub-Q terbutaline. Next, we have clonidine. So clonidine is an alpha-2 agonist. So this is very different here. So what happens if you only stimulate the alpha-2? So remember, if we go back uh, to what we were talking about before, alpha-2 is going to decrease the overall secretion of norepinephrine from the presynaptic neuron. So this medication can be used to decrease blood pressure. Uh, you have to be actually very careful with clonidine, though, because if you stop it really abruptly, then you might see a significant rebound hypertension. So next we need to talk about the indirect sympathomimetic. So the indirect agonist uh, will either cause norepinephrine release from the presynaptic terminal or they're going to inhibit the uptake of norepinephrine. So let's talk about these. So the first one we have are the amphetamines. So they work by releasing stored catecholamines. Uh, this can be uh, used, unfortunately, as a recreational drug, so methamphetamines, if you watch a lot of Breaking Bad. Uh, if in medicine uh, you're going to use it uh, legally, uh, then you might use this for things like narcolepsy or severe fatigue. Uh, we also use it for obesity because this tends to uh, suppress the appetite. And then probably more than anything, we use this for attention deficit disorder. Next, we have ephedrine. And ephedrine, this is, uh, will release stored catecholamines, very commonly used in oral uh, uh, nasal decongestants. It can also be used in urinary incontinence as well. And then cocaine. So cocaine works a little bit differently. Uh, it actually inhibits the reuptake of these catecholamines that have already been released. Uh, potentially, the ear, nose, and throat doctors will use this as a nasal decongestant. It can also can be used as a local anesthetic as well. Okay guys, that brings us to the end of the lecture. It's time for that end of session quiz. Let's go through those answers together. First question here, which receptors are stimulated by the following sympathomimetic? So the first one we have clonidine, remember that was an alpha-2 agonist. Dopamine, you get that D1 and D2 at low doses, uh, beta-1 and beta-2 at medium doses, and alpha-1 and alpha-2 at higher doses. Next, we have phenylephrine. Uh, it's going to be doing a little bit more alpha-1 than alpha-2. Remember, that's that vasoconstricting drug. Albuterol is going to do a lot of beta-2 with a little bit of beta-1. Norepinephrine is going to do alpha-1, alpha-2, and beta-1. So basically, it's just like epinephrine, but remember, it doesn't do any beta-2. Isoproteranol is a beta-1, beta-2. Epinephrine is the whole shebang. So alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, and beta-2. Dobutamine, this is going to be beta-1 primarily. You might get a little beta-2 as well. And then terbutaline is going to be a lot more beta-2 uh, and a little bit of beta-1. Okay, and the last question here, which sympathomimetic matches the following statement? So given as a nebulizer for asthma, so this is primarily going to be albuterol or levalbuterol. You could put in there epinephrine, but that's not going to be first line. The first line med for uh, acute asthma is always going to be albuterol and levalbuterol. Drug of choice for anaphylaxis, remember that's going to be that epinephrine. Remember those epipens that you can stab yourself with. Most common first-line agent for patients in septic shock, usually that's going to be norepinephrine. Given sub-Q uh, for asthma, that's going to be terbutaline, but also given sub-Q to, to stop um, labor is going to be that terbutaline. And then used by ENTs to vasoconstrict nasal vessels uh, could either be phenylephrine, or you could also maybe put cocaine there, but people aren't using that quite as much as they did before. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of Farm Basics 3. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.
Welcome to Who Wants to Be a Gunner, the show where we ask the tough questions that separate the real doctors from the future veterinarians. Let's meet our next contestant, Michael Rosenthal. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the show. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a third year med student, I'm post call, and I haven't slept in 32 hours. 32 hours? You seem pretty chipper. Oh, yeah. I'm totally buzzed on Starbucks and Skittles right now. I see. This ought to be entertaining. All right, let's play. Who wants to be a gunner? Okay, Michael, for $100, what is the primary neurotransmitter released by adrenergic neurons? A, norepinephrine. B, acetylcholine. C, nicotine. Or D, ephedrine. Norepinephrine? Is that your final answer? I'd hate to see you blow it on national television in front of your entire family with all your attendings watching. Norepinephrine, final answer. The primary neurotransmitter in adrenergic neurons is... A! Norepinephrine! Thanks to dumb luck, Michael has managed to win himself $100. Will he walk away with his cash and his pride? We'll find out after these messages. Welcome back to Who Wants to Be a Gunner? Michael here has astonishingly answered his first question correctly, putting $100 cash on the board. That was a pretty intense one, huh, Michael? <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> so you're in your third year, correct? Yeah. Does your school have some sort of quota program for special needs students? No. Is that my next question? Okay then, moving on. Your next question for $200. Which of the following medical conditions can be treated with an epinephrine injection? A. Bipolar disorder B. High blood pressure C. Anaphylactic shock or D. Erectile dysfunction You know, I, I'm gonna go with erectile dysfunction. Erection is mediated by the parasympathetic system, right? Uh, right. So, why would you treat ED with an adrenergic agonist? Oh, right, right. Anaphylactic shock, then. Would epinephrine counteract the systemic vasodilation and hypotension associated with anaphylactic shock? Yes. Speak up! Yes! So is that your final answer, then? Yes, final answer, Regis. Anaphylactic shock? is the correct answer. Mercifully, we are out of time. Join us next time for Who Wants to Be a Gunner?